and welcome back. Our guest tonight is Michael Cargill of Central Texas Gunworks. If you were watching the Alex Jones radio show today, you heard him right after Vigo Morrison. Alex was pretty excited about both those interviews, but Michael is here. He is a Second Amendment advocate, a leader in his community. He's going to talk to us about all things Second Amendment. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Thank you for having me. All right, now, there's a lot of stuff, but, you know, I told you this is off the record, you know, off, off camera, that the reason we have you in studio is because Alex was watching one of your debates last week, a town hall debate, and Alex was like, we need to get that guy on the show. I was like, Alex, man, I talk to that guy like every two weeks. He's at every event I go to. Alex was like, well, I haven't talked to him yet. So that's what brought you here in the studio. Just tell us a little bit about that debate. Awesome, yes. We had a debate, a debate in uh, Georgetown, and it was a town hall meeting setting in the courthouse, mm -hmm. and they wanted to focus on gun control in America, and basically you know, they invited you know, members of the Brady campaign and some other individuals uh, in the community to you know, discuss gun control and, and about taking, care, uh, taking uh, Americans' gun rights away from them. Right, that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> and I'm sitting here and I'm looking at it and they have one, you know, you have a whole panel of people up there, but there's one lady in particular that struck my interest. She was somebody from the crowd, uh, lady comes up and she says, hey, you know, I was raped and I wish I had had a gun. And, you know, they feel the questions back to the, to the panelists and nobody really had a, a good explanation as to why this woman doesn't need a gun or why she needs a gun and maybe has only seven bullets or, you know, whatever the, the rhetoric may be. Right. You, you have some people that have that mindset of just like the Virginia Tech shooting that when the shooter came into the one room and fired a few shots and then left that room, went to a different room, uh, one guy that was laying on the floor grabbed the only weapon he could, which was his cell phone, right. and dialed 911, and at being on the phone 20 minutes uh, with the 911 operator, it, uh, you know, the shooter then came back into the room again, ended up shooting him in the rear, mm -hmm. and then a young lady next to him grabbed his phone, and the shooter went out again, and then she's on the phone with 911, and then the shooter comes back into the room and continues shooting. Right. You know, and, and they will tell you that in a situation like that, they still believe that anyone with a concealed hanging license would not have been able to help them. And that's the whole thing, like, well, what if, what if you missed? Okay, what if I scared the guy away? Right. You know, right. and that was one of the things, I think that's the last time I actually saw you was at the rally at the Capitol, and that was one of the very things that you were, you were marching for was uh, carry on campus. Tell us about that. Right. Uh, I'm a big supporter of concealed carry on campus because uh, back when I was in the military, I got a phone call by where the Red Cross uh, said that I had a family emergency. I need to come home. So I went home to find out that my grandmother decided that at 70 years old, she was going to travel back to college to get a college degree. My grandmother only got a high school education. So at 70, she wanted to become a nurse. Well, while she was traveling from a college library, sitting at a bus stop waiting for a bus to come, mm -hmm. a guy came along, mugged her and raped her. Wow. And at I the bus stop. At the bus stop. And I decided at that point that I would make sure that every female in my family had the tools they needed to protect themselves. It's not about, you know, being able to carry a police officer on your back or your shoulders. Mm -hmm. It's not about me helping women out. It's about empowering them to protect themselves and not needing a man to do that for them. And that's exactly what we see because when we talk to these uh, people at the town halls and we talk them at the, you know, the debates, the marches, wherever they may be, and they're, you know, for stricter gun control, they say, well, you know, if you have a problem, call the police. You know, and, and the thing is, two minutes, okay, let's say the cops do get you at two minutes, how, how much damage can be done in two minutes? I don't want to wait for the police officer to get there, as well-intentioned as he may be, as well-armed as he may be, that's not helping me right now in this moment. Right, we had a shooting in the University of Texas back in September 2010. Mm -hmm. Guy with the AK-47 came onto the campus, shot a couple rounds in the air, went into the library, went upstairs, shot and killed himself. Mm -hmm. Do you know who the first police department was that arrived on the scene? Who was that? It was APD, not UTPD. The first police officer wow. that arrived on the scene, you know how long it took him to get there after the first shots were fired? How long was that? It was 20 minutes. Your, your longest shootouts take place in 30, I'm sorry, 12 minutes. Your longest shootouts take place in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So 12 minutes to get there. The first police officer that arrived in the scene did not uh, go into the building right away. You want to know why? Why? Because the shooter had an AK-47 and he was a motorcycle cop with a handgun. Mm -hmm. And he was, he, was for, he was waiting for backup to arrive, more firepower. See, I don't want to be that person who's waiting for police to come and save me. I want to have the tools I need to protect myself and to protect my family. And you brought up a very good point there because the things, well, the police get here. Now the police are here. And I'm not mad at the cop. You know, he, he was outgunned. You know, uh, whatever the situation may have been.
but now you have to wait for you know more more backup to arrive, possibly a SWAT team. How long does it take a SWAT team to get together to get out there on the road? Correct. And and people will tell you that well, what if the police officer arrive at the scene and see the CHO holder with the gun? They're going to just you know mistake that person as a shooter. No, that's not going to happen like that. Uh, that CHO holder, when he gets that person in sight, will deploy that firearm, mm -hmm. stop that individual, reholster that firearm, and then start giving first aid to the other people that have been shot. Exactly. By the time the paramedics get there, that person will need first aid from giving first aid. Yeah, I mean, that's a, the thing. People who have a CHO responsible gun handlers, you know, they're not going to run around like a John Wayne movie waving their gun in the air. They're going to wait until the moment, if, if that should ever occur, pull out, draw down, fire, and then rehulse. You made a very good point. But you also brought up another point that a lot of people will criticize. Well, the guy in this particular situation had an AK-47. Why does this guy need an AK-47? Nobody should have an AK-47. What would you say to somebody like that? Well, no one needs a Mercedes. No one needs a BMW, but we all want them. So we, you know, we can afford to buy them. So, you know, don't tell me what I can, I cannot have. This is the United States of America, and that's why it's called the land of the free, land of the brave. Right. All right, now, that, there's a lot of topics I want to talk about with you. We had an article about you earlier this year, back in January. Texas gun shop owner calls for Groupon boycott after deal is nixed. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. We did a, a deal with Groupon, and well, we did a concealed handgun license class uh, for two people. And so the deal went live, and... After one day of the deal going live, uh, my Groupon rep gave me a call and they said, man, Mike, you know, your deal, your deal is going great. You know, it's looking like it's going to sell out. You know, can we increase the amount of people that can purchase the deal? Mm -hmm. I told them, sure. So go ahead and let's, you know, double it or triple it. You know, whatever you want to do, I'll go ahead and sign, you know, the contract or send you an email and we'll make it happen. Right. Because we do everything in writing. They said, great. So they went forth and do great things. That next morning, I came into work. He called me up. He said, well, you know, Mike, uh, the CEO of Groupon has decided to suspend all gun deals, anything related to gun ranges, shooting ranges, shooting clays. Uh, shooting classes, groups, anything. Right, yeah. anything dealing with guns, they're going to cancel those deals. And I said, why? You know, the deal's going great. Well, because of the, the incident in, in Connecticut and what's going on. Oh, uh, so the, now we have to stop right. everything gun related. So now we're going to focus on certain tools. It's okay, you know, to have a deal where you go to a, um, a porn studio or something like that, but mm -hmm. it's not okay to have, you know, the gun deal. Uh, where, where people are actually learning safety and learning the laws. Of yeah, how to it's such themselves. a knee-jerk reaction because there is an incident. Uh, you know, just like the, the recent incident with this uh, reporter on Rolling Stone, I don't know if you heard it on the Alex Jones radio show today before you came on, they were talking about the reporter, and his car allegedly caught fire, burst into flames, you know, when he struck a tree. And I'm wondering what Mercedes has to say in retort of that. I'm pretty sure Mercedes isn't going to be happy with the fact, with somebody saying that their car just burst into flames if it is to strike something. Right. We're targeting lawful gun ownership in this country. We're not going after the criminals. Here in Texas, you know, just like you said about accidents, you have over a thousand people, a thousand fatalities here in the state of Texas uh, this year mm -hmm. so far. A thousand fatalities. Okay, on our Texas highways. Right. You know, you ask them how many people have been killed by firearms. You're not going to come up with a thousand. <laughs> right. And that's the thing because we we see all these groups. They're saying, well, we need this to protect the children. We need this to protect the children. I actually have this article right here. It says, 15 year old son of deputy shoots burglar suspect. Burglary suspect. So this is a situation where a child, you know, uh, a child was left home alone. I believe he has it had his sister at home mm. with him at the time. Somebody breaks into the house. The young man pulls out his uh, father's AR-15, repeatedly shoots two suspects, hit, hits them both. Lo and behold, some a kid actually knows how to aim, hits them both, drives them away. But then you have people saying this kid should have never been home alone with these weapons. No, and, and Texas law allows for that. It's called Penal Code Section 46.13. There's a section in it that says that if your child gets access to your firearm to protect themselves or the family, mm -hmm. then um, there's no prosecution for that. You know, it gives you a, a little way out. Uh, so, hey, you know, we look out for people, you know, that break into our homes and the kids are home and they get access to the firearm and use it responsibly to stop that threat. Exactly. And speaking more on that, we have this Home Alone 12 year old shoots intruder. Now, this is a, uh, a young lady in Oklahoma. She was home alone. Somebody breaks into the house. She calls mom. Mom, what do I do? Mom says, grab the gun, run to the closet. Young lady hides in the closet, uh, hoping to be undetected. The gentleman or the intruder comes to the door opens, the door is wiggling, the handle, she shoots through, lo and behold, hits the guy. And see, we talk about a plan all, all the time in class. you got to have a plan. You need to have a plan of what you're going to do to protect yourself and your family. I tell people, you know, if someone breaks into your house, 
What is your plan? What are you going to do? Where's that gun located? Is there around the chamber? Is right. it on safety? What does steps have to take you to fire that gun? And so I actually try to get them to get a plan. If someone breaks into my home at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, I'm going to get all of my family members into a safe room. We have a code word. You have the alarm. If, if that code word is used, the alarm goes off. I want everyone to make it into the safe room. They make it into that safe room. In my safe room, I have a monitor where I can see my cameras 360 degrees around my house. Every entrance of the exit to my home has a camera. I can see as far left as the left side of my neighbor, as far right to the right side of my neighbor, every entrance of the exit to my home. They break into my home. My family members are accounted for. I'm not going to accidentally shoot one of my loved ones. I want to stop that threat. So it's about having a plan and protecting your family because when it boils down to it, no one's going to protect you or your family. Police are not going to arrive then enough time. All right, that's a very, very good point because you get all these people and even people who are responsible gun owners, the situation they run into, if somebody, lo and behold, breaks into my house, I don't want to accidentally shoot a family member. So I heard you talk about things such as code words and places to go. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Right. We use, I use a code word um, like in my shop. We have a code word in event there's an emergency inside the shop. We're doing a concealed handgun class of about 60 people one Saturday morning. And I had a class of 30-something odd number on one side and another uh, class of about 25 and some odd number, total of 60 on another uh, side of the building. And we're doing a concealed hang-on class. And everyone was on break. Um, they were, you know, in the restroom, shopping, or doing whatever outside smoking a cigarette. And the guy came into the shop, and he wanted to buy a gun. Mm -hmm. He wanted to buy a gun to kill somebody. And he was shaking, and he had the cash to buy that gun, and he was going to buy that gun, and nothing was going to stop him from buying that gun. Mm -hmm. Well, my staff used the code word. And when they kicked that code word in, which, you know, never been used before, uh, they used the code word. I said hi to the guy and I identified what the issue was and I hit the sound alarm mm -hmm. and then get the police roll in that direction. And so I engaged that individual, start, gave him the paperwork, said, well, I'm going to help you buy that gun. You know, you know, <laughs> here's your paperwork. And you say you got the cash. All right. You have all the cash. You know, I want yeah. to help him buy that gun. And then police showed up. We got him outside. And when we got him outside, his girlfriend, some other people showed up. About 10 police officers showed up. There was a big fight outside in the parking lot, not in my shop. Right. You know, it's up to, up to me to make sure I keep uh, my employees safe, my customers safe, you know, and I want that to happen outside, not in my shop. Have you heard anything about that since then? Have you followed up at all? Yes, they actually took him to get a mental eval done. Okay. All right. Well, see, that's a situation where a mental evaluation may be necessary, but we hear all these people saying, well, for somebody to purchase a firearm, we want them to have a mental health evaluation, but under the new Obamacare, it says that no, uh, no interaction between you and your physician are private anymore. So right. let's say you, you're mad at Lo and behold, maybe the Spurs lose tonight. Right, right. I'm mad at the Spurs loss. So I'm gonna go out and kill somebody, and then oh, you're gonna kill you don't kill somebody, Mr. <laughs> Smith. Well, let me uh, report this, and then next time you go into you know the gun shop, you get flagged. Right, exactly, and and that's the one thing we're, we're afraid of. Like uh, our soldiers, uh, we're our soldiers are deployed overseas and in a in a hostile situation. They return back home, and they have some issues dealing with what you know took place overseas. Oh, yeah, right. Actually shooting someone and those issues. Well, then they label them with PTSD. When they get mm -hmm. back home, some people feel that, well, since they're labeled with PTSD, we should take their firearms away from them. Yeah. And then they'll turn around and redeploy them back into that war zone. Exactly. It's okay to have your firearm when you're overseas protecting someone else's constitutional right. rights or someone else's freedom. But when you're here in the United States, we're going to take yours away. Yeah, and we see this. They've been demonizing veterans coming after the gun rights, you know, demonizing them in all the shows and so forth. But then again, you know, most veterans here, if they own a, a rifle, it's probably a semi-automatic, even though they're shooting fully automatics, flamethrowers, God knows what, over there overseas. But I, I don't want to focus just on that. <laughs> uh, let's get back onto this. We get another document cam shot. Now, this is a situation, a group in Houston, I believe they've done this in other, other cities as well. Mm -hmm. They're giving out shotguns in high crime neighborhoods and like I said I believe they are doing this other places do you agree with this strategy I agree 100 percent you know we need to give the power back to the people not go to the local police department and turn your guns in right. for five dollars or whatever it is and, and I'll, since you, <laughs> I, we'll, we'll get back to the Houston thing but I want everybody to know I've talked about this before but I want everybody to know this in states such as Arizona mm -hmm. you know state of Gabby Giffords where Gabby Giffords got shot when you turn in your gun to the police they don't destroy it, they resell it. Which is to say the gun that shot Gabby Giffords could be back out on the street today mm -hmm. because they resell it. And they also do it in, I believe they do it in a suburb of Chicago. So you think about that, next time you go to turn your guns and they give you a little dinky $25 gas card, they're gonna resell your AK-47, your AR-15. Yeah, there you go, right there. Arizona law forces cities to resell guns 
from buyback programs. So there you go. Just, so it's, just so keep it's, that in mind. So it's not really about safety, is it? It's, it's a, not about safety. It's about boil, making money. When it boils down to it, it's about making money. Okay, I'm sorry. Now I interrupt. Now <laughs> tell us about these shotguns in these high crime areas. Yes, I. I we need to empower you know, the families to protect themselves. We mm -hmm. need to focus on families because law enforcement is just a phone call away. Um, yes, give the shotguns to the families so the families can protect themselves because the police are not going to arrive there in enough time. So I, I, I applaud this organization that's donating firearms to, to families and to the to poor, the less fortunate. Because right. even our concealed handgun program that we have here in Texas, um, it, you know, it costs money to take a class, you know, mm -hmm. you have to pay for the class and then get the license, mm -hmm. uh, the fingerprinting done and all that stuff. So we've kind of gotten away from, you know, like Vermont, in the state of Vermont where it's constitutional carry. Everyone can carry open your concealed without a license. We've gotten away from that and it's all about money now. You agree with that? Yes, I agree carry. with that 100% constitutional carry because everyone should have that right to protect themselves you shouldn't have to go get special permission from big brother to you know to carry a handgun right <laughs> all right now mike i want to get your opinion on this we saw recently president obama he went down to mexico and he's standing there in front of a big crowd and everybody's cheering him on he says the reason for gun violence in this country is because these guns came from the u.s which is true but they came not all of them but a good number of uh your more exotic guns, I guess you would say, came from the United States of America under Operation Fast and Furious that gave guns to Mexican drug cartels. Now, we hear all this rhetoric about background checks and stricter gun control, but we gave, under this administration, weapons to Mexican drug cartels. And the defense I always hear is, well, you know, we had Iran Contra and we had these other things. And I'm not saying we didn't, but this administration gave weapons to Mexican drug cartels. Right. Um just like what the, the government is doing right now and focusing on giving arms to another country right now, they're going to let the same thing happen uh, there that's happening in Mexico. Uh, we need to de decriminalize marijuana and take that control away from the drug cartels and then hold the administration re uh, accountable for what they're doing in selling arms or tracking arms or whatever they think they're doing mm -hmm. because that's not helping the problem. Uh, they need to focus on their laws. They know when they... Uh, guns being purchased and you know they're tracking all that stuff you know and so they need to focus on you know on their side of the house and leave the people the american people out of it mm. now i don't have an article for this but it just popped in my head when we were discussing the topic of mexicans and this boils down to more hispanics but on the uh the background checks for the, for guns i believe it changed in the past year where it has an additional box for people of hispanic origin are you familiar with that yes Okay, so how, when you saw that, what did you think about that? Yeah, because they, they added a different box now. You have 10A, 10B, yes. uh, not Hispanic or Latino or Hispanic or Latino. Mm -hmm. And then you pick uh, uh, 10B and say white, black, or Asian, yeah, yeah. or whatever. Right. Um, and the reason they, they say that's for is to track, you know, these, I guess, supposed guns going to Mexico or whatever, whatever Hispanic countries, uh, gang violence, whatever. We, we, do, we do something a little different in Texas since we actually border uh, a foreign country. Mm -hmm. In Texas... If you purchase two handguns or two loan guns in a five-day period, they've actually forced the gun store to fill out a form and report you to the FBI mm. without your knowledge. Right. Okay, so because we're bordering Mexico. So that, that's one thing that, you know, I don't think people are, are aware of. I'm glad you mentioned that. People know that now. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, um, I'm against universal background checks uh, because I don't think that we should focus on um, individuals and one person being able to sell a gun or a firearm to another private individual, mm -hmm. you know, I, that's that's one thing that we should do on the gun store side of the house. You know, we do background checks in the gun store. If a gun store goes to, to a gun show mm -hmm. to sell a gun in a gun show, they have to do a background check. Um, they have to fill out, the person has to fill out the form. Uh, we have to call the FBI and the NICS and do the background check in the gun show, gun store. Uh, as long as you're an FFL, a federal firearms license. Right. So, Now, I want to go back to the debate briefly, then we'll get back to our articles when we saw you in the debate last week. Somebody brought up the point that, you know, he goes to a gun show and he sees all these uh, licensed dealers selling thousands of guns and, and all that. And then, then you had a retort to that. What was your retort? Well, the thing is, he said that, you know, he sees private individuals selling thousands of guns. Okay. And I said, well, if you see a private individual selling thousands of guns, I just want you to know that's a felony. Uh, that's illegal, and you need to report them to the ATF. Can you explain to us why that is? Because if you're selling firearms for profit, mm -hmm. then that's illegal according to the ATF. 
okay? If you're just, you want to just sell your one particular gun, your five guns or whatever that you have in your stash, you can do that at the gun show. But when you get to the point where it's a business for you, then that becomes a felony. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. All right, now I want to go on to the racial views of guns because we see so many people saying that guns are for white people their guns are to oppress a, a specific race or class or whatever we have this article from the la times la times announces white men are terrorists they're not jihadists they are white right-wing americans nearly all with an obsessive attachment to guns who may represent a greater danger to the lives of american civilians than international terrorists well you know in in my family you know, I, which are, we're all, you know, black, mm -hmm. African American. Um, I actually was raised by a retired minister and he was 96. My great grandfather was 96 when he died. My great grandfather used to always have this Bible with him. And he would say to me, Michael, I like to bring everyone to Lord. He always had that Bible. My great grandfather would open up that Bible in the middle of that Bible. There was a hole cut out. He said, Michael, I like to bring everyone to Lord. My great grandfather would reach into that Bible and he would take out a revolver. And he said that when I cannot bring them to the Lord, I will send them to the Lord. You know, so uh, personal safety is, is for everyone. It's right. not just for whites, blacks, Asians or whatever. It's for everyone. Everyone's concerned about that. And everyone's got guns. It, it, certain people are more concerned about knowing the laws and, you know, and keeping themselves out of the system than mm -hmm. others. I, you know, I, I said on, on the show earlier that, you know, we have over a million people that are locked up in this country, you know, getting to the race issue. Mm -hmm. A million people locked up. Out of that million, majority of them are black, mm. are African American. So those are the ones that are going to be faced and having to deal with uh, new laws, new gun control laws. Exactly. Because you're going to give tools to law enforcement to go after, uh, put more blacks, lock, you know, lock them up in jail uh, with these new gun laws. And so no, that's I why I definitely agree with that. But I want people to know it's it's beyond a racial issue because we see things. Like in Florida, a man was charged with five felonies for releasing balloons. I'm not sure if you saw that article no. or not. I'm, I'm dead serious. This guy, he was out. I believe he was getting a, a Valentine's gift for his, his sweetheart or whatever. You know, they were out. He says, hey, baby, I love you. And he releases some balloons. Rup, rup. Cop pulls up. Excuse me, sir. Uh, did you just release those balloons? Like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just hanging out. Shock, shock. Take him to the... To, to the paddy wagon, and now this guy got hit with five felonies. Wow. I'm not exactly sure, you know, what happened to him after that, but just the, the notion that you can be charged for something so simple, something so meaningless, is just another attempt to get everybody into the system. Right, right. And I'm curious what the charge was on that. It was, uh, I don't know, maybe we can pull that up real and quick. I, and I tell you, a felony, you're talking, you get charged with a felony. That means you, according to the federal government, you cannot eat, possess or own a firearm. And that's the whole point. That's the exact point because people think of felons, uh, you know, your big, big time drug pushers or your violent offenders, you know, people such as that. They don't think about somebody releasing balloons as a potential felon. We see people getting arrested for selling lemonade. I'm not necessarily saying that's a, a felony, but we've shown those videos. Just anything is a felony now. Right, right. I mean, just thinking outside the box is a felony. But that's okay. We won't belabor that point. I want to go back to this racial issue. Mm -hmm. I have this article right here. Danny Glover claims. Danny, Danny Glover's claim versus the history of racism and gun control. Were you familiar with what Danny Glover said? No, no. This happened, uh, I guess, back in February. Okay. And he said uh, the Second Amendment was basically, well, is to protect slave owners. That was the history, the genesis of the Second Amendment is to protect slave owners. No, the, the, the original intent of the Second Amendment is so that the people can protect themselves from their government. Exactly. <laughs> and I mean, this was this was a you know mild internet meme at the time. I believe uh, Ben Swan made a an article about this. But basically, uh, somebody was asking Danny Glover. I believe he was at a uh, at a college giving mm -hmm. a speech, and they say, "Hey, Danny Glover, what do you think about guns?" You know, because I guess Sandy Hook had happened recently. And what do you think about guns? He says, "You know, the the gun laws in this country were to protect the slave owners." But then we think about the some of the first gun laws in this country were just the opposite. They were imposed on freed slaves, mm -hmm. and not just uh, guns, but any type of weapon, swords, or you know whatever type of instruments right. that they had at the time. Right, right, right. And I, I believe the original, the uh, you know when they actually started gun control, and it actually it targeted you know the uh, the black community, um, with and and slaves and and back in that time frame, of. You know, let's take the guns away from the slaves. That way the slaves can't protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And in me, I, I want to learn from the Jews. I definitely want to learn from the Jews because you remove my firearm, 
then you're going to, you know, take my money, control me and take my home and, and everything else goes. You know, right. once you take that gun, everything else goes. And, and my motto is, you know, when they come after my guns, I'm going to give them my bullets first. Mm. Yeah. OK. Now, I think we actually found that article about the balloons. I, I was make sure everybody knows I'm not making this up. OK, so the guy was charged with here it is. Man faces five years in prison for releasing balloons on beach as a romantic gesture. Wow. Let's see, I, I see felony up there. I see the crime against the environment. That's what it was. Wow. Yeah, so that's real. Yeah, I think a couple of paragraphs above that, it talks about the felony. Yeah, according to the Sun Sentinel, let's see, he saw, yeah, it's an act of love, but a, a felony. So there wow. you go. There you go. Just another attempt to get you in the system. Now, our time is coming short, but I just want to, I want people to know that you're not just all about guns, you're about other activist issues as well. As a matter of fact, the first time I met you was down in San Antonio at a RFID student protest with Andrea Hernandez, yes. a, a family we've uh, documented on this show. And it had nothing to do with guns. You were just out there concerned. And tell us why you were there. It's, it's about life, liberty, and prosperity. It's about keeping government um, transparent and the people's business private. And government should not be tracking uh, people you know we should not be listening in on on you know US citizens you mm -hmm. know they need to be transparent but our business needs to be private what goes on at my home is my business stay mm -hmm. out of my home stay out of my bedroom you know and leave my guns alone yeah I mean when I'm at home on the toilet I don't necessarily have anything to hide but I don't <laughs> think that's anybody's anybody's business but we, we we come to the end so can you give us your final thoughts yeah, and, and like I said, my motto, you know, and my name is Michael Cargill, owner of Central Texas Gunworks, mm -hmm. and I like to remind people. That's know, here in Austin. Yes, here in Austin, Texas. Stay on target, stay on message. Life, liberty, and prosperity. And when they come knocking at your door to, you know, to take your guns, then give them your bullets first. There you go. Michael Cargill, Central Texas Gunworks. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. That's a good interview. And that was Michael Cargill. I definitely encourage you, if you are in the city of Austin or in Central Texas, go to centraltexasgunworks.com. Also go to the physical location. There's a lot of great stuff there, not just guns, also concealed carry and so forth right there at Central Texas Gunworks. And also, if you'd like to support this broadcast, you can go to prisonplanet.tv. You can see the Alex Jones radio show, the nightly news, the special reports. All that is right there at prisonplanet.tv, including that weird Bilderberg thing. Oh, man, I can't, I can't get over that thing. I hate just looking at it. But don't, don't go back to a markup. But also, uh, you can go to the InfoWars shop and pick up some good come and take it shirts because we had a lot of Second Amendment news today. So you can see them all right there. The AK-47, the AR-15, the one for the ladies. All of it is right there on the InfoWars store. So that's it for this edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. We'll see you back tomorrow. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show. <laughs>